Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about the ZW Star S50 again, and we're going to be looking at how well it performs for lunar photography and planetary astrophotography. And uh, this is because this has been asked again and again and again in comments or in direct messages to me. So. I decided to make a quick video to answer that. And so a few nights ago, because tonight is cloudy, I managed to take some of the good weather that we had in early evening to point the sea star at the moon and also to point it at Saturn, uh, which was basically the only large planet that I had available at that time that I'm aware of. And at that time, by the way, I had fireworks going on behind me there, like official fireworks with like loud bangs. And I could see the sound waves, the sonic waves actually shake the telescope. You could see the image shiver while I was taking those images. Anyway, how did it go? First things first, in some one of the latest firmware and software updates for the C Star, go to the moon was added. Uh, before that, you had to kind of point to it manually. And for me, it worked pretty well. So no issue there. And I had the moon pretty much centered in my field of view. Once you're uh, on the moon, you can focus on it by simply tapping on the moon and then clicking the autofocus button. And after that, what I did is take a video of the moon. And you can see on the screen right now, this is what the video looks like. If you zoom into the moon, you can see that there are kind of waves of air, like the, the moon is like shivering, shimmering uh, because of the atmospheric turbulence. And this is why I'm taking a video. I'm also taking a video of the moon with the raw video mode activated, which means that the image that's being taken is uncompressed. And actually, technically, it is also still Bayard or Bayard, which means that we get the raw image from the sensor. So the image actually appears to be black and white, but we'll be using some processing software, which is free to debayer it, find the best exposures among the video that we took. So basically the, the exposures where the moon is affected by the atmospheric turbulence the least and then stack those exposures together before we can sharpen the image. So I'll go through that process very quickly with you guys in a moment. What was very interesting is I took a couple of five minutes long uh, videos and those videos, because they were raw videos, were seven gigabytes of data each roughly. So that's a lot of data. Oh, and by the way, just to preempt any questions on this, since we are taking raw video, the file sizes are so large, we see the atmospheric shimmering. The video feed was actually disturbed by the sound waves from the fireworks behind me. I think we can fairly conclusively say that this is not an AI picture of the moon. This is not like the Samsung Galaxy phone situation. This is the actual data from the moon. So we'll go in a moment to process those uh, moon images to see how it looks like once we're doing the processing. But long story short, you use the sea star to go to the moon, the telescope points at the moon, you focus on it, you take a raw video, and then you will need to plug in the sea star to the PC. So you have the, uh, the USB-C port here. You can plug that in via the USB cable that is provided by the C with the uh, C star. And it will act as a mass storage device, just like an external USB drive. You can drag and drop the files, the video files to your computer before processing. So that's very easy. And the moon is actually perfect for the sea star, just like the sun was. It fits just right in the field of view. And honestly, the tracking of the moon during that uh, whole five minute long video was absolutely perfect spot. Now, what about Saturn? <laughs> so here comes the real problem of the sea star. The sea star is a telescope that has a focal length of uh, 250 uh, millimeters. And it has a, a pixel size of the camera sensor in it of 2.9 micrometers. This gives you an image scale that is simply not enough for planets. I'll show the video of that on the screen, but you can see that Saturn looks absolutely tiny. And it's just on, a ve on very few pixels at the very center of the frame you don't see any details there. You do see that Saturn has wing rings, which is pretty cool, but you'd see that much better in uh, a telescope, a visual telescope of the same price. 
And when you see that, the image is so small that there are no details to recover. It makes no sense to even try to stack images or sharpen them because there is no detail to be sharpened there. So you'll be able to see the rings of Saturn with this smart telescope, which is still pretty neat. And you'll be able to see Jupiter and the moons of Jupiter, at least the four major moons of Jupiter, which is also pretty neat. You might even be able to see the uh, cloud bands of Jupiter very slightly, although I wouldn't really bank on it. And what's very interesting is that the telescope has not even been, you know, prepared to image planets. There is no planetary mode on the telescope. There is astrophotography for deep sky objects. There is solar, there is lunar, and there is landscape, but there is no planetary mode. So to do planetary, to actually center on Saturn, I had to go to the Sky Atlas in the app, search for Saturn, which is very easily findable, and then go to it. And then I cannot choose the astrophotography mode because it is made for deep sky astrophotography and it will take long exposures, which is not suitable for planets. So I had to use the lunar modes. So it's kind of like working around the way that the scope works to take some images of Saturn in this case. But since so many people are interested, I feel like it would be good for ZW to just add like a planetary modes, but maybe as an advanced feature or as, you know, just in case, because you ask for it kind of feature, you're not going to see much. Honestly, if you're interested in planetary, you want to get a proper visual telescope rather than a smart telescope. If you spend the time through a visual telescope looking at a planet, you see more and more details. I spent literally hours looking at Jupiter, looking at the cloud bands of Jupiter. You can see Jupiter rotating slowly on itself. You can see the moons of Jupiter moving ever so slowly. You can see even shadows of moons on Jupiter, basically eclipses there, which are not going to be visible with the C-Star S50. So if your main interest is planetary, the C-Star S50 is not for you. And with that, let's go inside and look at the lunar side of things. Finally, I promised I would. So let's go inside. Oh, and before we get inside, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're new, in which case, welcome. Click that bell icon, leave a comment about what you think of this, this telescope and how it can perform for planetary. And like the video or dislike it. It really helps YouTube understand whether this uh, video is worth showing to other people. Plus, if you do subscribe to my channel after or during watching this video, uh, your astrophotography skills will get 10% better and you will get 20% more clear skies. Guaranteed, obviously. <laughs> And of course, if you really want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You click that join button down below, or you can join my Patreon link down in the description. You guys truly make the channel possible. Thank you so much. But now let's go inside. And so we are inside. I am on the computer and let's have a quick look at one of the videos that we took. And you can see I just opened the video in the media player and you can see those weird artifacts. And this is due to the fact that this video is in a raw format. Basically, the C-Star took the output from the sensor and just dumped it into a video file with no processing whatsoever, including a very critical step called debayering, which allows you to actually get the color data out of your color color camera. Don't worry, we can get rid of that very easily by simply using free software. The software that I used is AutoStackert. I'll put links down in the description. And AutoStackert, you can open your video file. And you can see once it is open in AutoStackert, you can actually see that the, uh, the moon is now like proper uh, video. There is no issue there and we can zoom into the uh, the image to see the details of the moon. This is a single frame and honestly it already looks pretty darn good. And you can go through the frames, you can uh, play the video and you can see here the atmospheric perturbation of the video and sometimes the video shivers and that's likely from the fireworks and the sound of the bangs from the fireworks. But you can see this is there, that's like the moon kind of like blobbed out, that's from the uh, the fireworks, but you can see the impact of the atmospheric tur turbulence. And what this software does is it will find the best frames, the frames that have the le least shimmer and stack them together. 
Now, I'm not going to go through the whole flow of how this software works because this planetary and lunar astrophotography is actually uh, the type of astrophotography that I'm the least good at. I'm not an expert by any means. And so I don't want to set an example that could potentially be a bad example. But long story, story short, you press the analyze button, you press place AP grid here, and then you click on the stack button at the bottom. That's pretty much how it works and it will create uh, a file, an image file, uh, with like the stacked result of the best frames from this image. And you can see I set it to, set, to stack only 10% of the overall frames that I got, only the 10% best frames. And playing with this uh, percentage has the biggest impact on your image because if you stack too many frames, you start including frames that are very affected by the atmospheric shiver. Whereas if you stack very few, it you typically get better results. And here is the result that I got uh, after stacking those frames. So you can see they don't look that different from like single frames, although you can tell that like the, the, the corners here, the, the, the edges of the moon are a bit smoother uh, than before. You can see also there are some very dark areas. This is like stacking artifacts, uh, basically. And this is the same image, by the way, opened twice because I did two different ways of processing. On the left-hand side, to start with, I'm going to show you very briefly how a very natural type of sharpening can happen on the moon based on the data that we have here. So I'm going to apply the sharpening. Here it is. And you can see the mountain range here is now visible. The craters are much better visible, but you start having like artifacts at the edge of the moon. Uh, someone who is like better at processing planetary and lunar images than me would likely have ways to avoid those artifacts. But you can see the before and after there's definitely a gain of clarity there. You can see details within this crater, for instance, the center mountain of this crater and then a, a, a super small crater within the crater itself. And this is already like, I'll, I'll be honest, this is pretty cool. So that's one way, one method that I used of sharpening and have another one on the right hand side where I went kind of like almost overboard. But I think a lot of, for a lot of people, they would prefer this result here. You can see that it's much more sharpened than the image on the left, although it tends to like saturate the highlights here. Uh, still, we see like some really good details in the mountain range, but personally, I prefer the more natural processing on the left. Uh, but it's really up to you as the person doing the processing. I'm using my usual deep sky astrophotography software to process those images. There are free software available for lunar photography. I'm just not the best guy to ask about those because I am not an expert. But this should give you a good idea of what is possible with the ZWC star with regards to lunar uh, astrophotography. And just for the heck of it, I opened, by the way, the, the Saturn image there. And yeah, there's not a lot to see. And stacking this image would not really let us do anything. So you can see why I'm saying that this telescope is not really suited for planetary astrophotography. You can kind of see that Saturn is here and Saturn has rings, but not much more than that. Jupiter will be a bit better, but not that much better. So do not get this telescope if you want to do like mainly planetary. This is not the scope for you if that's the case. The scope is really for solar, lunar, and honestly, mostly, really mostly for deep sky astrophotography. That's where it shines the most. Although for solar is really cool because you can see the dark spots and it's gonna be awesome for the annular eclipse that's coming up and for the uh, total eclipse next year in the US. With that, I hope that this was interesting to see more about the capabilities of the Sea Star Smart Telescope for lunar imaging and for planetary imaging. Although in that latter case, it's more like the lack thereof. Uh, so yeah, I hope this was useful. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment about what you, th you thought of uh, this lunar imaging and planetary imaging. And I will leave you with the final image of the moon that I got, the very uh, over sharpened one just for the fun. Uh, so feel free to watch it as it zooms in. But more important than that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.